Solo, a Star Wars story, is a flop. That happens. Any film series can have the occasional misfire. What is worrisome for Disney here is that Solo isn't just a fluke. Four pictures into their reign over Star Wars, the clear and unmistakable picture emerging is that of a downward trend. What this trajectory suggests is that the public confidence in Star Wars is waning and that the brand is in a state of decline. In this post-mortem analysis, I will give my take on how things could spiral this far out of control and what measures can be done to fix it. In order to do that though, we must first establish some background context, which is vital for seeing the bigger picture. I will therefore begin by establishing how the original Star Wars trilogy became the institution it is regarded as. How Star Wars won the hearts and minds of generation upon generation since, and why Disney bought it in the first place. Then I'll describe how under Disney and Kathleen Kennedy's Lucas films, the audience for Star Wars has been contracting, before explaining why this is happening, and the turmoil behind the scenes because of it. Finally, I will offer my suggestions for how they can course correct to get out of the quagmire Star Wars currently finds itself in. The original Star Wars, or rather the original trilogy, is an institution. As tempting as it may be to simply take that as a given, it will be easier to recognize why the Star Wars brand is experiencing its current decline if we establish how Star Wars became an institution to begin with. There are many explanations why the original Star Wars trilogy movies captivated the audiences the way they did, but in my opinion there are three in particular which stand out. The first of those is the narrative structure. In crafting Star Wars, George Lucas and the many who helped in making those movies what they became were inspired by many different sources. The perhaps most notable inspiration was Joseph Campbell's the Hero of a Thousand Faces. This 1949 comparative study of mythological storytelling dissects and discusses the narrative structure and content of ancient myths and archetypical character traits that have reverberated since humanity's earliest written records. With Star Wars, George Lucas and his team were able to perfectly distill the mythical hero's journey in a way that had never been done on film before. Furthermore, this wasn't just applied to the original movie, but to the original trilogy as a whole. In so doing, they were able to assure a basic story structure that since the dawn of man has been proven to hit the right emotional chords and be memorable. After all, stories with this kind of structure were passed on through oral tradition in different cultures all over the world long before the invention of writing. Beyond the structure of the story, another reason for the movie's success was its epic scale and scope. Today we are inundated with epic big budget blockbusters, but at the time of the original movie's release, nothing even remotely like them had ever been made before. Lucas took inspiration from many different sources, old-timey serials like Flash Gordon and Buck Rogers, the script and storyboards for Jodorowsky's unmade Dune, Edgar Rice Burroughs' Martian Chronicles, Akira Kurosawa, and even the visuals of the Valerian and Laureline comics. By taking bits and pieces from all of this, they crafted something completely unlike anything the contemporary general moviegoing audience had ever seen before. That was a big reason why Lucas had such trouble getting the movie off the ground and made. There was no precedent, and no one footing the bill could imagine what it was and what it could be before it was finished. But like everything else, Star Wars was a product of its time, and it resonated with the spirit of the time, with the zeitgeist. By that I don't mean the 70s haircuts, but that it played on the fears and attentions of the contemporary public consciousness. The Galactic Empire was inspired by conquering empires of our past, and by the time of Episode 6, there were Nixon and Vietnam illusions as well. However, a thing modern audiences may need a reminder of is that there is now a greater distance in time between us and the original trilogy than there was between the original trilogy and World War II. 
the visual shorthand of dressing the Empire in uniforms which emoted Nazi Germany was an efficient one. And on top of that, there was a real-life evil empire, the Soviet Union. Star Wars came out during the height of the Cold War, when the Soviet Union was very much so a superpower and a real threat, both for its nuclear arsenal as well as its authoritarian Marxist collectivist ideology, which was spreading ever further beyond Soviet borders. To briefly summarize, with the original Star Wars trilogy, you then had a story that hit all the chords in an epic movie which went beyond anything ever made up until then, and which resonated with the public consciousness at the time. Audiences were blown away, and an instant institution was created. Many movies tried to replicate the success of Star Wars in the years that followed, but none were successful. Star Wars stood in a league of its own. The Star Wars brand grew as parents introduced the movies to their children while they were still young and impressionable, a cycle which would repeat itself, thereby creating ever new generations of fans. While other movies in the years following Star Wars got ever more large in scale, and there would become more and more properties competing for that same attention, Star Wars remained unmatched in scale and scope for decades. Not until the release of the first part of The Lord of the Rings in 2001 was there anything that could even approach it. But by then, after the turn of the century, the special editions were out, which received some backlash for their changes, and audiences were starting to accept that Episode 1, The Phantom Menace, hadn't been all that. Pas de vendeur, How are you going? I'm hot. I can imagine. But I'm hot too. But I'm cool. You know what I'm saying? Thank you. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I wish I could say yeah. the same. <laughs> when making the prequels, George Lucas did everything himself, which meant that he got to bring his vision to the screen in its purest form. But it also meant that none of those who had reined him in and provided the valuable input that contributed through the original trilogy ending up as the iconic movies they did were there to help him back on course if he veered off track, which he did. I may have gone too far in a few places. The mythological storytelling that had made the original so appealing was replaced by a disorganized new take on Citizen Kane. Where the originals had been in a league of their own, there now were movies that could compete. Indeed, Spider-Man did beat Episode 2, Attack of the Clones, at the box office. And where the originals successfully tuned into the public consciousness of the time, the prequels failed to do so, as the Bush and Iraq allusions didn't seem to stick beyond political circles. To be clear though, the prequels do have their fans, especially among those who were kids at the time of their release, kids who were introduced to them by the parents who still loved the originals. While one can argue that the prequels were a misstep, or that their execution was lacking, the Star Wars brand remained iconic. So much so, that Disney bought Lucasfilm and Star Wars with it in 2012. There was a time, not that long ago, that Disney was a bomb factory, with frequent high-profile misfires like Prince of Persia, John Carter, and the Lone Ranger, to name but a few. Bob Iger sought to change that, not only by tightening up their own in-house productions, but by buying up other branded studios like Marvel and like Pixar, and making them Disney subsidiaries. And at the time of the purchase, Lucasfilm and Star Wars looked like it might be Disney's most promising such investment yet. On paper, the plan to release a third trilogy and standalone spin-off anthology movies in alternating years so that audiences would be treating to a new Star Wars movie every year seemed like one that couldn't go wrong. They just needed the right person to execute this plan. Along with the Lucasfilm and Star Wars package came Kathleen Kennedy, who was then promoted from co-chairman to chairman, meaning she would serve as the showrunner, if you will, for all things Star Wars, just as Kevin Feige did over at Marvel Studios. 
Kennedy started out as an assistant for Steven Spielberg back in 1981, and has served in some producing capacity on most of his movies since, so her resume is an impressive one. Of course, how much, if any, of the success of those Steven Spielberg-directed movies was down to her direct input is something we may never know. What we do know is the trajectory the Disney-era Star Wars movies have taken under her leadership. A downward one. Each main episode movie, as well as each anthology movie, have both opened and finished lower than the one that came before it. This is no fluke, this is a trend. Four movies in, the numbers should be expanding. Instead, they are contracting. This is true not just for the movies, but for the merchandise as well. And that really sucks for Disney, because a big part of why they wanted to buy Star Wars in the first place was for all the merchandising rights that came with it. What we're seeing, though, is that Star Wars toys aren't selling, not like they once were. There are reports that numerous toy stores even put a cap on how much Star Wars merchandise they are willing to take in, as their recent experience is that rather than shifting units, Star Wars toys end up collecting dust on shelves. By contrast, Marvel toys are flying off the shelves, and there is circumstantial evidence to support that kids today are far more inclined towards Marvel than they are to Star Wars. These trends hold true in international markets as well, which also sucks for a global company like Disney. While Marvel goes from strength to strength everywhere, Star Wars appears to be contracting in territories where the brand already was well-known and popular. Worse yet, Star Wars has failed to gain a foothold in territories where it wasn't previously known, most notably in China, where audiences have more or less rejected it. Let's put it bluntly. As a brand, Star Wars is in a state of decline. It isn't gaining any new fans to speak of anywhere. On top of that, Solo's box office suggests it is even hemorrhaging older fans. How could something as beloved as Star Wars decline this bad, in most every way, this fast? I have some thoughts on why that may be. Let's break it down, piece by piece. Let's begin with the original movies. I'm sure many of you watching will have one or more of the original Star Wars movies at or near the top of your own list of favorite movies of all time. As such, it may be a bummer to learn that China and others don't just reject the new Disney-era Star Wars movies. They aren't won over by the original trilogy, either. How can this be? Let's go back to my three reasons why the original Star Wars trilogy won the hearts and minds of generations. The narrative structure, the epic scale and scope, and the resonance with the spirit of the time. All three boxes could be checked in the late 70s and early 80s, and partially even up to the early 2000s. But today might be a different matter. The narrative is still mythological storytelling, that will never change. But while the scale and scope of Star Wars were unique back then, they have been matched and even exceeded by numerous properties since, most recently by Marvel. The same goes for capturing the spirit of the time. It is a different world now, and the originals don't capture the spirit of our time. Incidentally, like the prequels before them, the modern Star Wars movies do not resonate all that well with current affairs either, outside of adhering to certain social politics, that is, which we'll get back to later. For now, though, even in this regard, Star Wars is thoroughly beaten by numerous other properties, again, most recently, as well as most notably, by Marvel. You know, the brand which actually is expanding worldwide. To summarize, of my three reasons Star Wars became an institution back then, only one holds true today, and in isolation, the hero's journey really isn't that big a selling point anymore. I submit that the original trilogy isn't as impactful for those watching it for the first time today as it was when earlier generations saw it for the first time. Allow me to bring in some circumstantial evidence right here. There is a point to it. I, myself, did not see any Star Wars movies before I was in my late teens, back in the late 90s. From my friends whose parents had introduced them to the original movies as kids, I had heard how Star Wars was the best thing since sliced bread. 
but by the time I saw the movies myself, more or less as an adult, I honestly did not see what the fuss was all about. Oh, I can intellectually recognize it, but I don't feel it, because I simply don't have any nostalgia for Star Wars, or any happy childhood memories associated with it. I believe that is why the Chinese and other emerging markets are rejecting Star Wars. They are told that these movies are the shit in America, but when they are experiencing the original trilogy for the first time, today, after seeing every blockbuster out of Hollywood the past decade, those movies really aren't going to stand out all that much. They might like them fine, but they won't develop any nostalgia or other fussy feelings towards the brand just because they're fine. And the new movies by Disney, beginning with The Force Awakens, culminating with Solo, all assume that you already grew up with and have a nostalgic love for the Star Wars brand, to audiences where that is not the case. The new movies, in their own right, really do not have a lot to offer. And so, the Chinese are no longer showing up for Star Wars. From their point of view, it's simple. Why make a deliberate effort to get invested in Star Wars, when they already are invested in Marvel and get their needs covered there? This may be true for kids growing up in territories where Star Wars is firmly established as well. Parents may try to get their kids into it, and I'm sure they at least in part will be successful, but on the playground, all the cool kids are playing with their Spider-Man, and Iron Man, and Captain America, and Black Panther toys. Because if it hasn't been made sufficiently clear already, there is a new king on the hill. The position Star Wars once held in popular culture has been overtaken by Marvel. But the problem isn't just that kids aren't getting into Star Wars the way they did before, and that new overseas audiences aren't getting into it at all. There are also indications that the older established fans appear to be tuning out as well. The Force Awakens did tremendous box office. It held the greatest opening weekend of all time, right up until, you know, Marvel overtook it. But it still remains one of the single-digit amount of movies in history to cross the 2 billion mark at the worldwide box office. That kind of repeat viewings show that there was a mass audience hungry for Star Wars, and who were hungry for more. Many have credited Kathleen Kennedy for this early success. But honestly, that first massively successful Disney Star Wars movie was the first new Star Wars movie since the underwhelming prequels. It was supposed to be that big, and probably would have been no matter who produced it. That's why Disney bought Star Wars in the first place, because of its iconic status. Since then though, the movies have continued to open big, but then declined fast. Right up until Solo, that is, which didn't even open big, but still declined fast. In other words, a massive chunk of the audience has dropped out along the way, and that is on Kathleen Kennedy and how Lucasfilm has managed the movies. Outside of the J.J. Abrams directed The Force Awakens, all Disney-era Star Wars have suffered tremendous behind-the-scenes issues, ranging from hiring then firing Josh Trank from the still-unmade Boba Fett to Tony Gilroy having to reshoot large parts of Gareth Edwards' Rogue One, to Ron Howard having to remake Lord and Miller Solo, to Colin Trevorrow dropping out of Episode 9. Either Kathleen Kennedy failed to properly vet the directors and thereby assure that they wouldn't go off script and make different movies than they were supposed to, or they did make the movies they were supposed to, but they still didn't work and had to be fixed after the fact. Either way, it's on Kennedy. Now granted, most audiences aren't aware of behind-the-scenes issues. It's not like they are advertised in the trailers. But audiences do pick up on how production issues and other changes behind the scenes manifest themselves on screen. And nowhere was this more obvious than with The Last Jedi. With Star Wars The Last Jedi, director Ryan Johnson was allowed to go off script and depart from the set out plan and make his own movie instead. And Johnson seems to have a thing for dividing the audience. I would be worried if everybody across the board was like, yeah, that was a good movie. It's much more exciting to me when you get, you know, um, a group of people who are like coming up to you and, and 
really, really excited about it. And then there are other people who walk out just, I mean, literally saying it was the worst movie I've ever seen. Having those two extremes to me is, you know, is the mark of a, the type of movie that I want to make. Well, if it was his intention to go all out Thanos and snap away half the audience, he was certainly successful in this. Make no mistake about it, a lot of people genuinely loved The Last Jedi. Some like it just fine, but a huge chunk of the audience absolutely hated it beyond belief. Like The Force Awakens before it, The Last Jedi opened to more than 200 million, but it concluded its worldwide run with just 1.3 billion, a measly figure given the opening, and an incredible 700 million less than The Force Awakens. The Last Jedi was the turning point. It was the Batman v Superman of the Star Wars franchise, the movie which caused a large number of built-in fans to actively riot against Star Wars. Under Kathleen Kennedy's watch, the Disney-era Star Wars movies have been infused with a left-wing political slant. Or, as many like to put it, the social justice warriors have hijacked Star Wars, and that is something new. Previous Star Wars, both the originals and the prequels, were always about good versus evil, but they never addressed, let alone picked sides, along the contemporary American political spectrum. The closest thing you got was that the Empire was a shorthand for the Soviet Union and its authoritarian collectivist ideology. The irony here is that while the proponents of the intersectional social justice politics infusing Star Wars proclaim to be on the side of good, these politics are an offshoot of Marxism and themselves collectivist and authoritarian in nature. In some sense, the current Disney-owned and Lucasfilm-managed Star Wars have become the Empire, while the fans revolting against this political takeover see themselves as the Rebellion. How do Lucasfilm and the media outlets sympathetic to their cause view this rebellion among the fans? Wouldn't you know, in much the same way as Sony and the same media outlets saw those who were critical of Paul Feig's Ghostbusters back during that movie's release. Anyone not supportive of it was then and is now labelled and named and shamed as alt-right, toxic, woman-hating, basement-dwelling, insecure man-childs, and most recently as incels. The strawman argument used against them is that they can't handle seeing strong female leads. Of course, that is every bit as much bullshit now as it was then, and I diversion to dismiss the real complaints. While there may be the occasional misogynist out there, on the whole, the protests are not about the women, but rather the political undercurrents and how they manifest themselves in character interactions, portrayals and abilities. The fan rebellion is ultimately about the blatant disrespect towards the property and towards the legacy characters done for the purpose of politicizing Star Wars. Another irony here is the futility of adding this political slant. While doing so will no doubt please everyone who feels the same way, it won't win over anyone who wasn't already converted to the cause. On the contrary, it will actually push those not converted towards the other end of the political spectrum, and it certainly isn't good for business. Case in point, the comic division of Marvel didn't do any wonders for the comic book industry. We all saw what happened with Ghostbusters, and what is currently happening with Star Wars. Going back to China for a moment, Star Wars had an uphill struggle there anyway, but what certainly didn't help matters was that the new Disney-era movies are labeled as Baizu, or White Left which the Chinese have a strong distaste for. Where everyone stands politically though, the numbers are very clear that audiences are abandoning Star Wars. Of course, other explanations have been launched to explain why Solo failed so spectacularly at the box office. Some suggest Star Wars fatigue, since we now have had two Star Wars movies opening within five months of each other. I think that's a lame excuse. Between Black Panther and Infinity War, Marvel just had two billion dollar movies opening inside of three months of each other, and Thor Ragnarok made a killing three months before that. If Marvel have shown anything, it is that fatigue only affects movies audiences have lost faith in. Like DC movies, 
and I guess now, Star Wars movies. Others have suggested that the marketing wasn't up to par, that the trailers came too late and failed to sell the chosen actor as young Harrison Ford. There could be some truth to that, although I'm inclined to believe that the bigger issue might have been that no one had asked for or ever wanted a solo movie not starring Harrison Ford to begin with. Greenlighting it is on Kathleen Kennedy. What you can be sure of, though, is that right about now, there is turmoil behind the scenes of Lucasfilm and Disney, and that there will be a reckoning. One possible casualty is Ryan Johnson's Star Wars trilogy. This was announced around the time of The Last Jedi's release, before the full scale of the backlash was known, and before Solo flopped. We haven't heard much about it since, and that would be because not even a story outline has been written. Apparently, Johnson is still trying to figure out what the essence of Star Wars is before beginning the writing process later this year. You'd think that the guy who already made and released Episode 8 would have a lock on that, but apparently not. In any event, it would be really easy to pull the plug on that entire trilogy this early on in the game. It's not like the fans are excited about another Ryan Johnson Star Wars anyway, but there may be another, more high-profile casualty. At the time of making this video, rumors are circling that Kathleen Kennedy may be looking to step down from her position as chairman of Lucasfilm. Could this be true? Yes, it could. She could be burned out. It's not like she's getting much positive press or fan support or anything else for that matter. Also, within the world of corporate politics, a human sacrifice is sometimes necessary. Following The Last Jedi backlash and solo bombing, I really don't think Disney will give her any choice in the matter, although they will no doubt be gracious enough to claim in public that it was her decision to step down, even if it's not. In either event, it's very plausible that Kathleen Kennedy's days at Lucasfilm are numbered. Who will replace her? Rumor has it that if she gets to name her successor, it will be Kitty Hart, who is the head of the Lucasfilm story group, and apparently she is even more gung-ho about socially progressive slash regressive politics than Kennedy is. Combine that with her not having any experience with running an actual studio, and Disney may want someone else. Many a fan wants Dave Filoni, George Lucas' protege and showrunner of the Clone Wars and Rebels animated series. But again, Disney might not want to elevate a TV showrunner to the head of a studio. They'd probably be more interested in finding another Kevin Feige type, someone who can run a studio while at the same time understands story structure, the property in question, and who excels at finding the right people to bring each part of a cinematic puzzle to life. About that, Kevin Feige is a huge Star Wars fan, and reportedly offered to consult on the new Star Wars movies, but was turned down. Maybe his input will be more welcome now. In any event, right now, with Solo bombing in theaters against the backdrop of the Disney acquisition of Fox being sabotaged by Comcast, they might not be interested in any public leadership drama, not at this time. So even if a change in leadership is on the cards, I don't think we'll hear about it just yet. But whether it ends up being Kennedy or not, somebody has a challenge ahead of them. Namely, unfucking the mess Star Wars now finds itself in. Star Wars has painted itself into a corner on several fronts. Johnson veered off the original new trilogy plan in The Last Jedi, meaning Chapter 9 has to be changed as well, and he really left the makers of that movie with a tough nut to crack. One year prior to the release of The Last Jedi, Carrie Fisher died. Despite having a year to work this into the movie, The Last Jedi still ended with General Leia alive and well, and looking as though she has a monumental role in the next movie. Good luck solving that in a way which won't offend half the audience. Just keep in mind, recasting didn't go down all that well in Solo. Speaking of which, Solo obviously set up sequels and ended on something of a cliffhanger. Really sucks for them then that audiences rejected both the movie and, by extension, Alden Ehrenreich as Han Solo. Where does that leave the planned Solo sequels? How are they going to solve this? 
I don't know what they're going to do. But if they ask for my advice, I'd suggest the following. First of all, remove the political undertones. Have all the strong female leads you want. Very few have any issues with that. But don't let an undercurrent of political ideology detract from the movies. Secondly, keep the Lucasfilm story group and continuity across all media, but maybe make some changes to the story group's composition. Then, cancel episode 9, at least for the time being. So many had such a bad reaction to The Last Jedi that there is no going forward. Not yet, especially with that movie tying up so many loose ends, which by rights should have been left for episode 9 anyway. Instead, do an old Republic trilogy. Get fans excited for Star Wars again. Make movies that work on their own, which are consistent with, but that don't rely on nostalgia for the original trilogy. That's how you can win over emerging international markets. Then, years down the line, go back to Episode 9, which can take place another 20 years after The Last Jedi. Conclude the open character arcs as an afterthought, and continue the story with new characters. In the meantime, Continue the anthology movies, but no more movies dedicated to legacy heroes. Don't make a Leia movie, and don't make a Lando movie. Do make an Obi-Wan Kenobi movie though, bringing back Ewan McGregor, that's the one exception. Also, make a Darth Maul movie, and have it include cameos by Amelia Clarke and Alden Ehrenreich, just to tie up the loose ends for Solo. And a Boba Fett movie, and even a Darth Vader movie, would be most welcome. I'd even welcome a Tag and Bink movie. Now that would be something for Lord and Miller. Granted, I am, at best, a casual fan. But something like that would at the very least keep me interested. But where do you think they should go from here? And how do you feel Star Wars has been handled thus far under Disney? Let me know in the comments. If you like this video, then please click the subscribe button. And don't forget to click the bell icon to be notified for all the latest uploaded content. Due to recent changes to YouTube's monetization policies, we'd also like to ask you to please consider supporting Midnight's Edge and its sister channel Midnight's Edge After Dark through Patreon. As thanks for their support, patrons will receive early notifications of mini-documentaries, special behind-the-scenes Making of the Edge videos, bloopers, outtakes, lost episodes, and more. You can support the channel for as little as $1 a month. Be sure to check back for news and analysis on the corporate politics behind your favorite genre movies, as well as updates and discussion here at Midnight's Edge.